You are listening to Investing Matters, brought to you in association with London South East. This is the show that provides informative, educational and entertaining content from the world of investing. We do not give advice, so please do your own research. Hello and welcome to this Investing Matters podcast. My name is Peter Higgins and today I have the huge privilege of speaking with the former Goldman Sachs analyst, globally known and respected Neil Sharp, the Executive Director of Content and Strategy at Edison Group. Edison is an investment research and advisory company with global offices. Good afternoon to you, Neil. Hey, good afternoon, Peter. Good to be here. Thank you for joining us on this Investing Matters podcast, Neil. I would like to start, Neil, this conversation with the, the point that you graduate from London School of Economics. So you're already one of the bright sparks, you know, emerging talents <laughs> of the e- economics world, right? With a Bachelor of Science degree in economics, um, then started your career at Price Waterhouse in 1994 in the banking, capital markets and treasury tax team. Um, what do our audience need to know about the fundamental career drivers of you, Neil Sharp, the younger of 1994, 95, 96? So, I mean, I, I studied economics because I, I like to, you know, understand how the world works. Um, and it's a sort of combination of social sciences and maths, which were two things I enjoyed. Um, behind it all is just someone who's curious about the world. Uh, I have, I love learning about the world. I'm an avid sort of listener of podcasts and I love digesting information. Um, my dad, who was a profound influence on me, um, was, was an accountant, uh, that was his profession. and. Um, Economics is one of those subjects that it sort of qualifies you for everything and nothing at the same time. And uh, I really didn't know what I wanted to do. And his suggestion was, well, go on and get a qualification first. Uh, it'll give you an opening into the, the, the working world. And so I didn't I didn't actually look that far. I, I went to Pricewaterhouse, did, did the um, ACA qualification. It gave me a really good grounding. It gave me exposure to a range of different companies. And I kind of found my feet after that in terms of uh, what I wanted to do. So this fascination with the equities market, um, you know, what made great quality companies is is really what sort of um, opened the door. So I was looking to get into equity research and as luck would have it, I got an opening into Goldman. Yeah, fantastic. I I was going to go to that next. So in in 1997, you joined the pan-European research team at Goldman Sachs, um, specialising in covering construction and building materials. How, how did that come about? And um, tell us a, a little bit about your time there, please. So the, the uh, it came about because one of my friends worked at Goldman, and they, they you know let me know that they were looking to to hire someone into that team. Uh, I ended up working with um, Mike Betts, who was a veteran in terms of covering the sector. And, and look, I mean, it's one of those things that mentors are really important, people who've got uh, a deep understanding of a sector. And, and if you look at equity analysis, the legend of <laughs> equity analysis, uh, Mike learned uh, from a guy called Angus, and he was one of the very first analysts who actually took time to analyze. And we're going back, you know, many decades. Mike learned his trade through Angus I, and, I, and then, you know, passed on that heritage to me. Um, it was a really interesting time to join. So 97, Goldman was still a partnership. It was a very small uh, equity research team at that point in time. Um, and, you know, we, we, we went through effectively the uh, dot-com boom. Um, which was, you know, a lot of money flowing into the sort of equity side of the business. Um, and, and my time there, the, the research team expanded considerably. Uh, it was interesting covering an old school sector at a time when internet and tech were in the vogue, um, which is good for me. I mean, I think I was able to learn my trade uh, whilst not necessarily being in the limelight. Um, Mike, Mike actually left Goldman after about a year of me being there uh, and I was given the opportunity to run the sector after a, a year. Um, so it was kind of a sort of sink or swim type approach, <laughs> you know, come in. My, my head of research backed me and said, look, I think you could do this. And I was grateful for the opportunity. Um, 
and it, it was a really enjoyable journey. I mean, I think it was, uh, you know, from a coverage perspective, it was covering a sector through a seven year cycle, um, seeing the ups and downs. We saw the Asia crisis. Uh, we saw the, the dot com boom and bust. Um, we saw, I guess, a mildish recession towards the end of that period as well. Um, and I learned from some very, very good people. I was surrounded by, you know, some exceptional minds who were covering some of the other sectors, and I learned a lot from from them in terms of how you go about covering a sector. Um, and then more broadly, I think, uh, you know, what I saw at Goldman was a firm that had a culture of wanting to succeed um, and navigating the equities business through, you know, firstly, the, 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 the expansion, um, then, you know, actually running the business through the Spitzer um, reforms that came through and separation of investment banking and, and equity research. Uh, and, and trying lots and lots of different things to make it work. And I learned a lot through that period. Um, mm -hmm. And then, you know, after seven years, I guess, uh, you know, there comes a, that, that itch, a natural calling point in times of time, time for a change. And so at the, towards the end of 2003, uh, a new opportunity came about and I, I decided to, uh, to have a go. Indeed. I mean, you, you left um, 2003 to set up Tusker Capital, yeah. a long, short yeah. hedge fund. So tell us about that. I mean, because that's a big step away from what you're doing um, at Goldman and a, a huge responsibility. Yeah, I mean, I think, look, I mean, that came about because a very good friend of mine, um, someone I'd known, I, I grew up in Kenya and uh, a friend of mine from Kenya. We were both at university together. Um, he was working at Morgan Stanley as a trader. Uh, I was working at Goldman in equity research. Um, he uh, he was visiting Kenya and got carjacked um, and took a bullet through the head. <laughs> um, and it, you know, I mean, he was very fortunate. The bullet went through his cheek uh, and out his jaw, um, but he survived. And as part of that sort of process of him, him thinking about what he's going to do next, um, you know, I suggested well, we'd always thought we'd want to do something together. So we came up with the idea of a longshore hedge fund, uh, setting that up together and launching it. And, um, you know, he's still running it today. Um, it out of the uh, very glamorous location of Manhattan Beach. Uh, it's done really well. Um, he's an exceptional wow. trader. I think what I learned from that entire process is it's quite a lonely experience when you, when, you know, moving from a big organization to a small organization. It's quite a lonely experience setting things up for yourself. Um, and it was interesting in terms of, you know, marketing uh, the, 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 the fund to prospective people. I just felt, um, I learned that actually I couldn't switch off when it came to managing other people's money. <laughs> Uh, so it, I think if I'd stayed in, in terms of money management, my health would have deteriorated <laughs> considerably. Yes. And so I, you know, after a while I decided that I'd return into the, to, to, to my roots of getting back into equity research. Um, and I started looking, but having done something entrepreneurial, uh, there was a, I, I mean, I did go for, you know, interviews at various places. I, I remember going into the, uh, the offices of Credit Suisse and um, Deutsche Bank, etc. And, and there was a sort of small heart sink moment when you sort of walk through the, the these large atriums of these very big buildings after you've done something entrepreneurial. And as chance had it, I met um, Fraser Thorne, who had set up Edison um, in an office that was so small that actually all my interviews with him, or sort of conversations with him, were actually in the British Museum. Uh, <laughs> so, and I like that. I like that that this was, you know, a small um, opportunity, it's something that you know I could sort of throw myself into, and uh, that is how I sort of arrived at Edison. Um, Fraser was actually looking for an analyst. I, I think I convinced him that actually what he needed was someone who could run the research team and scale up the opportunity, and uh, it was. It was an interesting concept at Edison. Um, 
you know, I'm, I'm a big believer in equity research, having worked in the industry for a number of years, I can see, you know, the impact it can make. Um, the, 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 the issue that the research industry, equity research industry has always faced is that um, the funding for it um, has, has come consistently under pressure. And actually, you know, I'm sure we'll go on to talk about the UK Investment Research Review, but that is at the heart of the UK Investment Research Review, which is research is valuable, the funding, the traditional means of funding it are, are in decline. Um, Edison sort of had this idea of taking a leaf from the bond rating um, guy's books, which was taking a retainer from the corporate um, and, and running an issue of sponsored research um, uh, sort of product. You know, at the heart of it, there's this big question as to if a company's paying you, um, you know, would anybody trust that, trust you? And I, I remember having first met Fraser, I, but my very first port of call was going back to my former heads of research at Goldman just to talk, talk through you know, what they thought of it. And I, I think my eureka moment in all of that was um, where one of them said that, look, ultimately research is a brand game, that you know, if, if you can get the quality of the product right and associated with your brand, people people let worry less effectively about you know the, the, the sources of funding etc um, and I think that that's what I sort of embarked on doing at Edison which was how do I build a great quality research product uh, research offering um, and, and and that is what I've been doing for the last 20 years uh, oh, brilliant thank you for that for response now um, we're, we're in the month of January, so I'll, t I'll take this moment then to just wish you a happy 19th anniversary um, with regards to joining Edison Group in January 2005. Thank you very much. Um, you. So, so Neil, can you just expand for me, um, please, and give us an overview of the understanding of your role currently as the Executive Director of Content and Strategy at Edison Group and, and what that encompasses, followed by an overview of Edison Group its solutions, Edison Research, its differentiated services, including investor relations, strategic consulting services, and of course, some companies that you and your colleagues work with. Yeah, sure. Um, so look, I mean, I, I think the easiest way of doing that is to explain, you know, how we started and how the product evolved. Um, we started it as an issue of sponsored research company. The, the, the value proposition that we put to companies was that we would write high quality research, including once a year a shelf note piece. It used to really irritate me when I was working in the hedge fund. Anytime I was looking for you know a meaningful note on a company, you might have to go back five years because you know most of the content was one pages produced on, on, on results. So one of, the, one of the key things I sort of set out doing is that once a year, there is a, a note that explains, you know, all the drivers of business, its business model, the management team, what it stands for, you know, how it operates in the market, it, it, the industries it's servicing, etc. Together with the usual stuff of financials and valuation metrics and risks. Um, we made sure that we cover companies at least once a quarter, so we cover things on a regular basis. The dissemination of that product is where it's very different from the traditional sell side. Traditional sell side only send product to their paying clients. We made sure that we made it freely available to all, all classes of investors. So this includes your tier one institutions, but also uh, you know the smaller institutional investors, the private wealth managers, family offices, retail, and very very quickly the product. I mean, I think timing is, any time you set up a business, timing is, you need a bit of luck, right? Um, and if you go back to, you know, when we got going at Edison, uh, 2004, 5, 6, 7, it was at the, the tail end of the credit boom, um, you know, the UK market in particular was, was doing really well. AIM was flourishing, there was a lot of companies particularly resources companies, etc., but lots of companies coming onto the junior market. Um, brokers were very, very busy in terms of listing these companies, and then a lot of these companies felt neglected in the aftermarket because you know their brokers had gone on to do other things. Um, so it would come to us for the ongoing coverage, and very, very quickly, um, you know, the business built itself um, into something which was substantial in terms of scale. So you know, covering at least a hundred companies. 
Um, the things that sort of surprised me from that point on, so, you know, we needed to validate our value proposition to the companies. Um, and, and I think promising companies that you're going to drive their share price out was was a false promise. There's so many other factors that, um, you know, reflect actually how a company does. So the, the, the way we we choose to, to validate our value proposition is that it's going to a very wide audience and it's being consumed by you know the right kind of investors um, and so you know we have analytics in terms of who is consuming our, our, our content um, and as we sort of showed that to companies I mean you know they were they were impressed that, that, that you know they were first time they were getting statistics in terms of actually who is consuming the research product um, but it also led to, you know, a very immediate sort of call for, well, can you help us meet these investors? And so that is where our investor engagement, why our offering started, which is organizing roadshows for companies and the readers of that research. And so we have st we started taking companies out onto the road, meeting, um, you know, investors that they weren't necessarily meeting through their sell side banks. Um, and that, that grew into you know a very successful sort of second part of our business. Over time, um, the business started internationalizing. So this issue that companies have in terms of lack of understanding, lack of meeting the right kind of investors, lack of liquidity is not just a UK phenomenon. It's something that you'll find in across all markets. And I think it surprised us at how quickly we internationalized the business. So, you know, very quickly we started picking up, you know, not just London listed companies and which is where we're based, but European listed companies, North American listed companies, ASX listed companies. And um, we started to find, you know, an international dimension effectively to our business. And that, 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 that helped in a couple of, it's symbiotic, you know, the, the, as you start covering international companies, your readership starts to internationalize as well. And so, you know, we started growing our international audience uh, in terms of who's consuming uh, the research content, but also then who we could roadshow companies to. So that's the, the bit that led to the globalization effectively of our offering. So. Today, you know, we operate out of London, but also have a presence in North America, in, in both the US and Canada. Uh, we have um, people on the ground in um, Germany, uh, Greece, um, Israel. Um, and I think, you know, what is interesting is that, you know, our, when we look at the readership of our, our content, it's it's read in over 200 countries. It's uh, consumed last year, I think, we had over 4 million people looking at our, uh, 4 million views of our content by over a million people. Um, so it's, it's wide, it's broad in terms of who is consuming that content. Um, my title changed from Director of Research to director of content and strategy, um, really on the back end of the pandemic. And I think there's two things um, that there have been significant changes uh, that I would sort of reflect on. The first is MIFID II. MIFID II, you know, fundamentally changed the, the equity uh, research market um, and effectively put up a wall around a lot of content when it previously might not have you know more it led to lack of accessibility to research content um the pandemic i think accelerated everyone's digital lives right um you and i are here talking uh, remotely to each other <laughs> and, and that's that's commonplace what we saw in terms of the content was that traditional means of getting of that content being read email and putting it up on the on the platforms was slowly being um, substituted by direct search and more and more people are effectively googling uh, for content and and arriving directly onto our website and our website is a really big call cool drawing drawer effectively in terms of how people consume our content um, and I think that if you think about the way people find content, and I, I try and draw sort of real live analogies for this in terms of how I think about my business. So 
you know, if you wanted to go for Chinese food in Shoreditch, uh, unless you happen to know the name of the Chinese food, you, 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 your, your search term is generally going to be slightly more generic, you know, good Chinese food in, in, in Shoreditch. And I think that the, the way I sort of structured our content is understanding that search mechanism, which is people tend to search by thematics uh, or topics first, and we've got two um, offerings in that. We have an Edison Themes, which is, uh, you know, I try and shy away from the big tomes of 80-page notes. It, I try and get our thematics in terms of, here's why this sector is really interesting, or this particular theme is really interesting, but in sort of eight to 12 pages. And then we also have a series called Edison Explains, which is, look, if you don't understand it, here's a sort of, you know, Q&A type guide in terms of giving you the basics. And, and that leads effectively people into finding, you know, the companies operating in that in that area, the space, etc. And, and my, my the, the other end of it is that the demographic in terms of who's consuming our content also changed quite a lot um, through the pandemic. So it used to be you know, middle-aged um, or late-aged people reviewing the Edison Research content, looking after their savings or their pension fund money. Increasing, there's a much more younger audience consuming that content, and younger younger audiences like to view video, like to listen to podcasts, and so we've introduced the audio-visual element into the content as well. So the, the directive content and strategy is really reflecting the fact that, you know, how people are learning about equities has moved from just the traditional research product into a much broader suite of, of content, um, and which is why I call myself a director of content and strategy. Um, strategy is really trying to help companies use our content and distribution channels to help them um, achieve, you know, what we set out. Um, as our offering which is to meet the right kind of investors so we will tell companies that you know working with us you will meet a broader group of investors and the right kind of investors who are, who are right for your company companies that we work for uh, we work for some very large companies so at the sort of upper end uh, you know we work for wheat and precious metals which is uh, you know several billion dollars market cap um, we work for Melrose, which is a FTSE 100 uh, company. We work for Greggs, which is a you know household name. Um, we work for some some really interesting sort of mid cap names, uh, things like Discovery IE. Um, we also work with some 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 smaller companies, some micro caps, so you know a Music Magpie or a, a, a name. So it's it, we work across the spectrum in terms of market cap. Um, and it, it's, you know, the idea of, um, you know, who uses us, um, it used to be that it's companies that, you know, were struggling for coverage. Actually, now it's the entire spectrum because I think there has been a little bit of dislocation in terms of companies and being able to access the right kind of uh, investors and our offering um, allows them to find solutions to that. And we've got a great track record. Um, on our website we publish some statistics in terms of if you look at our clients um, you know those which we've initiated on we typically see an uplift in volumes um, trading in those stocks an uplift in valuations uh, on those stocks and and that is that is it's 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 simple academic theory actually that you know if you if you put out content on equities etc they get noticed and the more people that look at them the, the more activity there is so um, it's a pretty simple business um, in terms of what we do I think there's there's quite a lot of appeal into for companies in terms of uh, you know helping us helping them achieve their goals and that's why they come and work with us indeed I mean you, you just you spoke about some of the companies you work for there um, but what you didn't touch on, and I will, I will add this in here for you, is that over the, the last decade or, decade or so, Neil, you've worked, or Edison have worked with the top four performing stocks in the FTSE 250. Um, they were Edison clients. Um, and of course, I'm referring to four imprint, Games Workshop, PPH Hotels, and Entertainment One, which of course got taken over by Hasbro yeah. for 3.8 billion in 2020. Um, please, can you, you've covered it, more or less covered it already, Neil, but please can you share 
where permissible, what has led to Edison's outperformance for said clients? I think, firstly, I think there's a certain amount of self-selection bias when companies come to work with us. Um, I, you know, I, I think the companies that typically engage or pay us to work with them, firstly, tend to be on the front foot. They feel that, you know, they're directionally going in somewhere. They feel that they're misunderstood in the market, that the valuation's in the wrong place. So it's very rare that a company that's about to have a profits warning would engage with, with Edison, right? I mean, sometimes they do because they want to explain the profits warning. And I think actually that is a sensible thing to do in terms of engaging with investors. But by and large, most of them feel that, you know, their management teams feel that our valuation's in the wrong place and that, you know, we, we people not necessarily appreciating where the business is going. So I think there's a certain amount of self-selection. Uh, there is a self-selection bias in terms of the clients that come and work with us. Um, the second is that they, they care about, you know, they, the companies who engage with us, they all care about investor relations, right? Again, it's one of those things that they, that they're engaging with shareholders matters to them. And I think that's another reason that you actually, they're putting time and effort effectively into this and that helps in terms of performance. And then finally, it is that, that simple thing, there's lots of academic research out there that says that, you know, if there's additional content effectively on these companies, you tend to see, you know, impacts on volume, uh, on valuations and, and volumes. The, the key is that, that, that most of that is qualified and that it needs to be credible content, right? So it's the fact that, you know, we put out what we think is good quality research. Um, you know, we, we stand by our brand. We, we, we tr we're not there to puff up a company. We're there to provide a balanced view of a company. And I think, you know, we've won, won hearts and minds on that. And, and, you know, you can evidence that by, you know, the readership, lots and lots of people consume our content, uh, the longevity, and ultimately, you know, the kind of clients that, that work with us. Indeed, yeah, thank, thank you for that full response. You touched on quality there. Um, fund manager Terry Smith, the founder and CEO of Fundsmith, has been, to, been referred to as the English Warren Buffett after achieving superior investment returns with strategies similar to the legendary investor Warren Buffett. Uh, Terry Smith is quoted as saying, when it comes to generating good returns, the most important thing is quality. What, in your view, are the best research strategies available to private investors to enable them to find the best quality companies now? So let me, um, what, what, uh, we run a, what, what I call a quality model portfolio at Edison called the Illuminator, and, and actually it will be made available uh, on the website on Monday. So when people come to Edison Group on Monday, um, that's Monday the 8th, I don't know when this podcast is, is, is going to go out, but um, you know, you will be able to see it. It's worth talking about the origins of, of the Illuminator. So when I, when I was at Goldman, I met someone who managed private client money, and it, he, it was notable because he turned down partnership at Goldman. Um, and the reason was that he was making more actually running private client money. And, and the, 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 his thesis was pretty simple, which is that to, to, to generate alpha, you need an edge. And he told me that, look, I can't tell you whether this biotech company is better than another biotech company or this tech company is better than a, you know, another tech company. But he said that I can tell you what the attributes of a high quality company are. Uh, and, uh, you know, he ran through a series of metrics, which I took to heart and I thought, actually, that's really smart. Um, and because at Goldman, I was in a position where Mike left uh, and I was running, you know, the coverage of my sector by myself, um, I, I created effectively uh, proxies for all these metrics and you know, so pulled in financial metrics that would reflect um, the, the things that, that people thought made up, you know, a high quality company. These are things like um, they need to, to be growing in excess of GDP. So that's a simple metric. You know, you can look at forecast growth numbers um, that, you know, they are, they've got 
that, that the kind of product or their service is effectively generating a return, which means that they're not going back to shareholders to fund their growth. And that's an ROE characteristic there, or a return on capital characteristic that you're looking for. That their balance sheet is in a position which allows them to, you know, have some tax efficiency, but also weather cyclical shocks. So it's modest uh, balance sheet positioning. That they've got a product which is, uh, you know, scalable uh, and internationally attractive. They've got a management team which is working in the interest of shareholders. And it's a series of metrics that we look at, um, which we call the Illuminator. And, and what we do is we rank the UK market based on these metrics. Um, and we, we pull out the top 10 uh, and have had them in a model portfolio. Now that model portfolio has been running since 2008. And the rough statistics for you, um, if the FTSE all share during that period, you know, went up by somewhere between 130 to 150 percent, the model portfolio went up by over a thousand percent. The the actual statistics will will be we we quote on the web page. So, I mean, it leads to substantial outperformance. And what what it's actually picking up is early stage outperformance of companies which is showing the right kind of metrics it catches them quite early and then you know we we see that grow over time um what are the names currently some of the names that we have in in, in uh the portfolio the model portfolio or well, rolls royce is in there i had a stellar 2023 um again it's 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 it it sort of turned around um the civil side of the business i think will continue growing um over over the next year but also we we like the leadership team that, that's driving rolls royce right move is in there um and you know had some wobbles because of the the sort of rate hikes and also some competition potentially coming in but it's one of those platform stocks that you know once you've got a dominant position in a particular market and you've invested in the technology, etc. You, your return on capital is fantastic, and it's actually very hard to um, take it. To, it's very hard, effectively, to displace that. And I think Right Move is exceptionally well positioned. Serica Energy is in there, um, which is you know a mid cap, which has done some fantastic things. Kept a very low profile valuation is extremely attractive. I think the Tailwind acquisition is going to lead to you know some some better returns um, going forward, and interestingly, the the company that sort of uh, came in um, towards the latter end of this this year was um, a, a business called Global Data, um, which uh, just in December actually had a spike because they had a private equity uh, investment in one of their divisions. It led to a spike, effectively, and it was it, that was reflective of the fact that the, the valuation was wasn't actually for the business wasn't necessarily what what was fair for the business, and I think there's further to run on that as well. And so we identify sort of ten high quality names in this model portfolio um, using the strategy, and there's much more detail on the website uh, to to get into. Um, and it tends to be relatively low turnover, so usually we see one company drop off. Uh, the list every month and one company replace it um, and it, it's led it's got a great great track record in terms of identifying companies that outperform the market um, last year was a tricky year in terms of investing um, so uh, when I look at the illuminator you know it's one three and six month um, performance metrics were actually up, up beat the market last year but on a one-year basis, it lagged. Now it was it was because I think we're in a slightly weird year. And we do see this, and uh, you know sometimes high-quality companies aren't necessarily um, rewarded, but over time I believe they will be. So the other thing I try and do is um, actually identify you know companies which have been oversold. So I will tend to look at companies where I think they look fundamentally cheap on a valuation basis and that they're they're in an industry where there is you know potential activity consolidation activity um, and I think that's another strategy effectively that, that I look to run in terms of um, you know trying to identify companies that are going to lead to our performance 
Indeed, I think that's a really good strategy there. I, I think it's wonderful that you've spoken about the Illuminator portfolio and the fact it's had such significant outperformance and it it's reiterates the, the value um, of picking quality companies but holding them over the long term as well. Yeah. Because what yeah. we're seeing now, I think I saw some piece of research which was saying that the, the, the time frame for um, investing now has gone all the way down to sub six months, Neil, which I find absolutely staggering. You know, it's almost like everyone's a trader now. Yeah. Well, look, I mean, I think, I think you know, that's the time and time again, you know, it's the, it's, it, we, we talk about the power of compounding when, when invest, looking at investing and it's, it's the, you know, was it Einstein who said it's the eighth wonder of the world, you know, and, uh, and I, I think that, that, that's what you you find, which is that actually holding on to these companies over a period of time is where you're going to start to see effectively those returns, um, you know, come through. And I, I, that's why I think it's it's interesting that the turnover of the Illuminator portfolio is is very modest. I, you know, if you've got ten names, one does drop out, but your your holding period for a lot of these companies is long. And there've been some companies, Right Move has been in there for many, many years, for instance. Brilliant. Now, I'm conscious of the time where we've got allocated for this interview, so we must, must, must talk about, Neil, uh, the Investment Research Review, um, which is aimed at bolstering the UK's capital markets, which need all the help they can get, to be mm -hmm. fair. Um, the review was led, um, or is led, by um, Rachel Kent, it was launched March 2023. Um, where are we since the review commenced and um, please can you share with us the the, second, the seven key recommendations uh, made by Rachel Kent. Yeah, I, I won't get into all seven, but I'll, I'll focus on the ones that I think matter. Yeah, um, focus on the ones that matter to us as investors. Yeah, yeah thank yeah. you. So Rachel, look, I mean, let me let me first say that one of the, so, you know, one of the things that, that, that motivates me in, 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 in terms of my role is the post-financial crisis i became aware of the fact that exchanges around the world were being asked by their treasury departments as to you know what can you do to help facilitate um, the flow of capital to our smes and that there there is a really good reason for doing this which is that um, if you look at economies that flourish um, is the, the vibrant SME sectors that, that lead to that that um, happening, and it's it, you know because these are the companies that tend to be the growth companies, the the, the ones that tend to expand and employ more people, that end up paying more taxes, that fund public services, um, and so looking after that segment is really really important and. We started working with exchanges around the world, actually, in terms of addressing this. And so I feel like I'm in a very privileged position because I've had direct exposure to conversations with not just the UK, but, you know, what the ASX, the New Zealand Stock Exchange, Singapore Stock Exchange, Tel Aviv Stock Exchange, the Deutsche Bourse. You know, we've, we've, done, we've looked, looked at a range of different exchanges and it... And it a lot of them implemented what we call intermediated solutions to help their companies um, with some of the challenges. And in, in two instances, we actually helped deliver the service. So for the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange and the Deutsche Bourse. And so when Rachel Kent was doing her stakeholder feedback, she ended up talking to me. <laughs> I kind of explained, you know, uh, you know, the work we'd done and the fact that actually the Deutsche Bourse scale scheme when 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 it launched its volumes were i think 100 percent higher than that you know what the companies that had migrated onto it had previously the tel aviv stock exchange scheme that we helped on um again saw similar kind of impact in terms of volumes valuations but also follow-on capital so you know i'm i'm a big supporter in terms of the work rachel's done i think she's done a fantastic job in terms of articulating the problem and the problem is that there is a funding issue in terms of research. Research, you know, she talks about this golden thread effectively, research being the golden thread that holds capital markets together. And um, she she has outlined a number of solutions to help that. The, the first being um, to create a research platform, and we'll get into a bit more detail about what that entails. 
The second is to give fund managers some more optionality in terms of paying for research from the asset owner run PL. So it's it's not quite rebundling technically, but it's effectively passing on the costs of, of research back up to the asset owners. Um, she's called for some regulatory reform in terms of if you look at the the, the the FCA handbook in terms of research, it's a hodgepodge of rules, etc. So some clarity in terms of of you know what the rule book is and, and this is important because actually quite a lot of people shy away from making research publicly available on the guise of there's a big compliance risk behind it. Um, she's called on actually drawing academic you know us leveraging um, academic uh, our academic institutions in terms of um, the research work some reforms to the IPO timetable have proposed and a couple of other things but probably the most important and all of that is the creation of a research platform. What is the research platform? Um, in, in essence, it's basically, you know, part of the reason we've seen companies, the, the, the great de-equitization of the UK market, part of, part of that is just the costs of being a listed company are very high. The cost of liquidity is high, you know, if you think of yourself as a listed company. And, um, you know, if the solution is to actually get notice, you've got to pay for more research, it's just another cost. So Rachel has suggested that um, there is effectively a stamp duty rebate that pays for the provision, the dissemination and provision of research um, for UK listed companies. And, you know, so in, our, in essence, a company which feels that I'm misunderstood or I want more coverage can approach the platform. The platform would use effectively you know, public funds to source and provide research from people like us or brokers etc. But importantly make sure that that research is freely available um, to as you know retail investors all classes of investors via the research platform. Um, where have we got to in that? Um, I think We've got to the point where I think Jeremy Hunt agreed with all the proposals in the Mansion House speech. Some disappointment that actually we hadn't seen much activity in the autumn statement. Um, and if I was guessing, I'm guessing that um, you know we'll probably see some some further progress to the towards this in the March budget. Though so this is pure speculation on my part, but we're in an election year. Um, the talk of the Great British ISA didn't materialise. Maybe it does in March, but accompanying that will probably be um, some decisions around the research platform. And actually, I, I think I think you know quite a lot of work has gone gone on behind the scenes. The Treasury Department has done quite a lot in, of, in terms of what kind of platform do we want, and hence what is the cost of running that platform, and then what is left effectively to fund the provision of research so i'm hoping that we'll see some activity around that if we do um i think i think it might be you know a great time to you can look at some uk stocks one the uk is by all measures i mean you'll you'll have had other fund managers on the podcast etc talking about the fact that the uk is cheap <laughs> um so i think it's i think yeah, so um, and then a company, uh, uh, you know, add to that that you know there is some some as a, an interventionist measure effectively to make more information available on um, UK listed companies um, and to level the playing field and to access a wider wider sort of community of investors through that, and and our experience of that typically leads to an uplift in volumes and valuation in other schemes. I think it might be, you know, that it might start to reverse the fortunes of the UK. And it, it, it's one of those, um, you know, if, if the UK is going through a death spiral, there's a chance of, of reversing that. And actually, it, you could, once you start to see that momentum, I suspect you'll see, you know, more and more uh, UK activity taking place. So I'm, I'm very hopeful that, uh, you know, the research platform does move forward. It, it's the boldest thing we've seen. Um, from all the sort of work in the other market so uh, you know I, I hope the UK you know takes the chance and, and implements it but at the end of the day it's politics and you never know right so it might it might end up just just 
you know, being a lot of noise and we never see execution on it. Well, I hope we do see some some action. I know that you're you're keeping everything crossed as well, Neil, to, so we get some some positivity through this political year. Um, you you almost touched on it, but I'm going to ask you a bit more there. If we do see some catalyst in 2024 for whatever reasons, um, who do you who do you and Edison Research Group see as some of the potential immediate beneficiaries um, within the, um, the UK markets? So I think I think firstly. Um... It, it's going to be a lot of those companies where you know the, the valuations are completely in the wrong place for you know, the, the kind of businesses that the, uh, the, <laughs> that they are, um, and that you know whether that's and that they haven't necessarily explained what they're doing particularly well, and I think some more research. So think of something like Team Seventeen, which which took you know a, a hit at the back end of last year. Um, but actually, I think, you know, the gaming industry, if you look at the long term drivers of the gaming industry, it's an attractive industry. And over time, I think that, that those kind of companies would would benefit um, a business like Costain, which, you know, is has has had its ups and downs, but I think is is going the right kind of way, but just is not particularly well understood by the market. I, look, I mean, I, I ran a, a round table for Rachel and put. 18 IROs in front of her just to have a discussion about the, the UK um, research platform and, and two really big themes sort of emerged from that so just in terms of constituents I had I tried to replicate what you know in 18 names something like the UK markets I had four FTSE 100 companies a clutch of mid caps and some, some micro caps small caps uh, around the table um, the feedback that, that I think sort of came through was that, that, that a lot of companies find that their marginal share price is set by the retail investor currently, and that that investor is not particularly well informed. Um, and, it, you know, the, the examples were that, you know, when a company says we are going to meet guidance or with expectations, a lot of investors have who don't have access to consensus and data platforms, etc., just don't know what, what that means. So having research that is made available is useful. Um, I also think that, you know, it's one of those things that we pick up when we're comparing UK companies to US companies. US companies will often put out a point estimate that this is our guidance you know, for the year, make it very publicly available, it's directional, we know where, where they're going. UK companies often don't, and I, I think just, just that sort of clarity in terms of where they're going is, is going to be important. Uh, the, the other, which uh, the theme that emerged, is that a lot of companies felt that they weren't necessarily meeting the right kind of investors, um, and I think the platform will help in terms of connecting them to long-term capital rather than short-term money. Indeed. Um, I think you touched on the valuations there, and we spoke earlier about um, the cheapness of some of the companies and the fact that they're neglected or they don't get their uh, communications out there to, to investors. In, in 2023, Neil, the FTSE small cap and AIM indices were busier indices with regards to, of all things, takeovers, mm -hmm. as they witnessed 13 and 20 takeovers respectively. Um, the average bid premium was 50%, Neil, um, which reflected the depressed valuations of so many UK smaller companies. How do we go about, and you touched on it already there, how do we go about ensuring that companies A, get out the message, and B, retail investors and institutional investors actually engage, purchase, and value our companies uh, accordingly? So, um, uh, uh, let's, so the takeover stat is okay. is notable, and look, I mean, the UK is, you know, if I was a private equity fund, um, I would find buying into the UK a very attractive proposition. Valuations are cheap. They tend to be sort of sensible companies, good rule of law, all of those kind of things. And you know, if you look at some of the names that have been bid for, I mean, I, I remember looking at HomeServe, for instance, where you know actually a sizable part of its business was in the US, and yet you're buying that business at a very low multiple compared to what you're buying in the US. So I I do think that there is scope effectively for that those valuations to unravel. Um, 
the in terms of how do we address those changes i mean it, there, there is no silver bullet to it, but i do think that the research scheme will help and the research platform would help considerably and why is that um well i, I think you know markets like momentum you know it's one of those things that the moment you start to see interest and share prices going in the right way there's this sort of you know it, it, it continues rolling and that's what we've seen in some of the other um that's what we've seen in some of the other markets which is you know when the deutsche Bourse ran the scale scheme um you know it was it, it there was more research made available importantly that the research was all in english language and one of the very big things that they saw was a, a much larger international audience coming and looking at these german companies because there was you know research in english that was explaining what these business, businesses did the same thing for the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange scheme that we ran. So I think that, you know, making more research available, it's not going to be the domestic changes effectively that, 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 that you know, it's that international investor coming in and looking at the UK. Um, I also think, look, I mean, it's, it's the fact that, you know, you are seeing some pension fund reforms taking place that there is going to be at the margin some institutional demand for for our, our our UK stocks. So it's a combination of, you know, these two things. It's making more content available, attracting more investors, uh, explaining these stories better to investors, um, whilst at the same time, you know, creating a, a little bit of a demand push. And and if you get that right, you know, it's the it's a virtuous circle. You know, I think I think you'll start to see the UK suddenly move on to the the front foot. But but the, you need to see these these schemes implemented, and I think that that's, that's a part of the frustration is lot lots of noise about it, etc. That you know around the the, the uh, mansion house speech, but we haven't seen any execution yet. Indeed. Now we we, we spoke of cheap and undervalued. You then spoke about the virtual circle. There doesn't seem to be a virtual circle in 2023, Neil, regarding the phenomenal growth of UK, sorry, US artificial intelligence related plays. Yeah. Um, and we, we got introduced to the new phrase now, which is the Magnificent Seven. Um, micro, Microsoft, Amazon, Meta, Apple, Google, the parent of Alphabet, um, Nvidia and Tesla. Um, obviously they outperformed um, immensely during 2023. Um, what is the synopsis of Edison's research regarding the outlook for the Magnificent Seven? Um, do you guys have any favourites or are you thinking, whoa, you know what, there's no chasing these, let's just back off a little bit. Um, what are your th what's the thoughts from the group? So the, the you know, let's take the AI part first. Um, so these are, the, these are phenomenal names, firstly. They are in many ways naturalistic monopolies. So they are going to generate, you know, exceptional returns. Um, the, the, it comes down to risk reward, right? Um, and what you're seeing of late is that the valuations of these companies, particularly when you saw that sort of last quarter spurt in, in equity prices, have continued to expand, yet the growth rates of these businesses have declined, right? So. Um, and that is that is a real challenge. At some point, you know, you are probably going to see people wanting to diversify out of the Magnificent Seven. I don't think we're there yet. I think there's further to run. And we're, we're, the reason why I think that um, there's further to run is the, the optionality piece. So if there is there are going to be winners from the AI race, my bet would be that the the companies that are most likely to capitalize on these are the Magnificent Seven. They're best equipped effectively to win their AI race. And so when you're looking at the growth rates, perhaps you're not necessarily factoring in the impact of AI on, on the growth rates going forward. Right? So I, I think I think that there is there there's good reason to have exposure to them. When I talk to professional managers, um, you know what they're doing is that, that they 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 think AI is going to be a dominant theme for the coming years, and they are doing a lot of groundwork in terms of the the other companies to take a look at the SMEs, and at some point they're going to pull the trigger on that, you know, and move away from the magnificent seven into 
you know, the smaller companies that are being exposed to the AI theme. And they, they, this is not just, you don't need to look at tech companies. I did a uh, interview with Polar Capital who identified Relex as a company that is benefiting, you know, from AI because, you know, their legal service is now empowered by AI and that becomes quite an interesting play. So you can buy into that AI theme at a slightly more reasonable valuation than perhaps the Magnificent Seven, if you look look at it. And I, that's where I think I think the diversification is going to come that way. And so I would put a lot of work into you know the companies that are exposed to the AI theme, uh, but are not necessarily the mainstream sort of Magnificent Seven. I, I my personal view is I'm very neutral on the Magnificent Seven. In that I think. The valuations are stretched, but I can see an argument for the growth um, perhaps being underestimated by the market. Yeah, um, uh, yeah, Relax had a, a, a fantastic year in comparison to, to most of um, our FTSE 350 stocks. Um, I think it managed over 30 odd percent for the year, so a really, really good call there with Relax. Um, Neil, I'm conscious of the time, so I'm going to ask you. Um, one last question, and so this is where I'm going to give you the magic wand to do whatever you want. <laughs> You're in charge, yeah. yeah. So this is my fun question. So I'm going to ask this one. I'm conscious of the time. Um, I'm going to give you the complete autonomy of the UK equity markets, Neil. Given said power, what thing would you change immediately to change the UK equity, capital markets, investment industry, and um, to place it on a better footing? Than it was yesterday and is no longer faced with a valuation discount to its US counterparts. Right, so I, I think that the answer to that is not one thing but a, a, a series of things. The first is I think we've got to get better at, at um, creating national champions, you know, the standout companies. The, the, we don't have an Apple, we don't have an ASML, etc. It used to be that you know a BP was a shining light in the oil industry, for instance. And I think that what we've got to get better at is supporting our growth companies. And part of that comes from the education, effectively, of our, our institutional investors in terms of supporting those growth companies. Um, which then leads us to you know the second piece, which is I'm a huge supporter of the research platform because I think the you know the the, the creating that ecosystem, creating effectively more information to help people make the right kind of decisions around that, is going to help unlock some of those valuations uh, and create create effectively the right kind of environment for for our, our UK companies. And then thirdly, I think it's actually, you know, empowering effectively the retail audience to participate more in the UK market. I mean, we're underweight compared to a lot of the other markets. So I think 10, 11, 12 percent UK retail participation in UK equities, 22 percent in Scandinavia, 40 or 50 percent in North America. And, you know, re-engaging that audience back into um, you know our UK companies is going to be, be key and, and part of that is helping them have the tools to make the right kind of choices uh, and I think a lot of them are still in the dark. Fantastic reply Neil, thank you ever so much. Um, ladies and gents, that was Neil Shah, the Executive Director of Content and Strategy at Edison Group. Thank you ever so much for sharing your insights with me Neil on this Investing Matters podcast um delight speaking with you today um wish you all the very best with everything wishing you and the team absolutely fantastic 2024 take care god bless you peter thanks for having me on it's been a huge pleasure thank you take care bye thank you for taking the time to listen to investing matters be sure to check out the london southeast website for free tools and info to research your next investment you can also join in the conversation on our social media channels. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more content, including our CEO interviews. Catch you next time.